Hi, I'm Carrie Woolib. I'm a potato extension specialist with Washington State University. And I'm excited to tell you about the new online potato decision aid system that we launched in 2021. The potato decision aid system or potato DAS as we often call it, is a kind of spin-off product from the tree fruit decision aid system that was developed about 15 years ago. These are web-based platforms designed to provide time-sensitive and site-specific information about the crop and about important pests or diseases that may be affecting the crop. This information helps growers make informed crop management decisions. The tree fruit decision aid system runs lots of insect, disease, and horticultural models. These models use site-specific weather data to predict when the crop or pest will reach important developmental benchmarks or when conditions will support disease development. This works very well because many developmental stages in the life of plants and pests are predictable based on temperature and other environmental factors. The models shared through the DAS system can even anticipate future status of the crop or pests or diseases by incorporating weather forecasts and historic weather data, in essence, extending the model out into the future. For each of the models, the system provides a graph showing current and predicted stages of the crop or pest, and then makes management recommendations based on that output. And it includes other useful things like a pesticide selection tool or smart spray guide. The potato decision aid system currently focuses on insect pest management, but we will be expanding to other aspects of potato production in the near future. Here's an outline for the rest of today's presentation. I want to give a quick overview of potato production in Washington and discuss why potato growers could benefit from having some extra support when it comes to making crop management decisions. Then I'll talk about some of the work that has led up to the development of this new potato decision aid system. After that, I'll show you how to create an account and I'll go over some of the features you will see and how to make the most of them. I work in the Columbia Basin in central Washington where 95% of Washington's potato crop is grown. Potatoes are a very important crop for Washington. Our growers produce more than 20% of the U.S. potato crop, which is a close second to Idaho's 25%. We have a very long growing season in central Washington. It's about 150 to 200 days. And Washington's potato growers can boast of having the highest potato yields in the world. More than 85% of potatoes in Washington are processed, and that means a lot of potatoes are grown under contract with processing companies that have very strict yield and quality expectations for the crop. It takes a lot of money to grow potatoes, and the profit margins are modest even for a perfect crop. Growers get docked for blemishes and defects, and they may even have loads of potatoes rejected if those defects exceed certain preset limits. Since insecticides are relatively cheap, many growers aggressively manage pests rather than risk big losses, and they tend to rely on calendar-based insecticide applications when they are unsure about where and when the pests will strike. It helps them to sleep at night knowing they have these things under control and that they're not going to jeopardize their crop and returns. But there are pressures to reduce these inputs when they can, and our growers are happy to save money in reduced insecticide costs so long as they can still sleep at night. Insect pest management is a good place for the potato decision aid system to start because insect pests can pose significant problems for potato crops especially in the Columbia Basin in Washington, where growers may have to deal with at least 10 different insect pests over the course of a very long growing season. Many of these insects can cause substantial economic damage by spreading pathogens that cause diseases, like the potato psyllid shown here that can spread a bacterium that causes zebra chip disease or aphids that spread potato viruses, 
and beet leaf hoppers that can spread a phytoplasma that causes purple top disease. And many insects cause damage by feeding directly on the plants or tubers, like the potato tuber worm shown here, or Colorado potato beetles, ligus bugs, and even aphids if their populations get out of control. To help potato growers manage all of these insects, I developed a comprehensive insect monitoring network for potatoes in the Columbia Basin. My team monitors insects and commercial potato fields using trapping or sampling methods that have been established for each of our targeted pests. All of those I just mentioned and a few more. We monitor about 50 fields every week from April to October. This enables us to provide potato growers with current information about the distribution and abundance of important insect pests across the region. So growers can anticipate pest problems and then do something to mitigate them before they get out of hand. We encourage potato growers to do their own insect scouting, but some insects are very difficult for the growers to monitor themselves. Beet leaf hoppers, for example, are very small. The adults are only three millimeters long and they require magnification to make out the features that differentiate them from several other leafhoppers that are common in the region. Three of the insects here are beet leafhoppers, but the rest are species we don't need to worry about. Can you identify the beet leafhoppers? So these in the red boxes are the beet leafhoppers. Since they can come in dark and light color forms, they can be very difficult to identify properly without the right equipment and training. When potato growers are not confident with their ability to scout for a pest, they may fall back on a calendar-based schedule for insecticide applications just in case, but this is not an efficient or cost-effective way to manage pests. Insect populations vary in size from season to season. Intervention with insecticides may be needed one year and not another. This graph shows the average weekly beet leaf hopper counts in the Columbia Basin each year from 2013 to 2021. In some years like 2014, the yellow line, 2016, that light blue line, and 2017, the gray line, the beet leaf hopper populations were relatively small throughout the region and potato growers didn't really need to worry too much about this pest. But in 2013, the red line, and especially in 2021, the black line, populations were very large and this put the crop at a higher risk for problems. Large yearly variations in the size of insect populations are very common. This is no surprise to anyone because insect survival and reproduction rates are very much affected by weather, especially temperature and precipitation, which comes in patterns that differ every year. Insect populations also vary spatially and temporally within a season. These maps show beet leaf hopper densities or population abundance as they vary across the North Columbia Basin. The numbers of insects increase as the color shifts from gray to blue to green to yellow to red. I like to present these maps to growers in a time series, like showing last week, week's map next to this week's map to illustrate change in pest densities and distribution. We use an interpolation method called inverse distance weighting to create these maps. For any given spot on the map, a weighted average of the number of insects is calculated using our monitoring network data. The closest sites give greater weight to the estimate, but all sites factor into the prediction. And it works very well. These maps were developed and validated by my WSU colleague, Dr. David Crowder, and his team of students and postdocs. Dave is also the director of the tree fruit and potato decision aid systems. The models used to create the maps were validated for each of the insect pests using what is called a leave one out cross validation technique. This was done by running the models with insect monitoring data from all but one site and then comparing how closely the prediction for that one missing site was to its actual observed value. 
This was repeated for every site, and since years can vary, Dave and his team validated data from multiple years of monitoring. The validation showed 60 to 70% congruence between the predicted and observed values. I asked Dave about this, and he said he was really pleased with how well the models work. He noted that with so many factors potentially influencing pest numbers in a field, like insecticide use or adjacent crops, it's really great that the predictions can be this precise. As a practical tool, it works very well. So this is the homepage for the Potato Decision Aid System. It's at potatoes.decisionaid.systems, and this is where you will start. Under the Pest Info tab from the homepage, you will find some general information about several important potato pests, like beet leaf hoppers, potato psyllids, aphids, potato tuber worm. Under the Articles tab, you will find information about timely issues. Like this article on potato pink eye, this disorder was showing up on some potatoes that were harvested this fall, and some people were confusing it with a disease called pink rot, so the article provides some clarification. The Articles tab also provides a link to potato alerts. The link connects you to my WSU Potato Alerts newsletter. It's a weekly report on the Columbia Basin potato crop, and it comes out every Friday during the growing season. This is the table of contents for one of the later issues of WSU Potato Alerts last year. These alerts include current reports about insect pests, diseases, and other things impacting the crop. And this is just an example or excerpt from one section of the newsletter. I aim to provide current observations, some education, and timely management advice in these alerts. To access some of the other features of the Potato Decision Aid system, you will need to register for a free account and then log in. When you register, you will be asked to provide your name, email address, zip code, and a password. This is the profile page once you have logged in. The left sidebar shows the menu for your account. The first thing you will want to do is select some weather stations for the locations you care about. This is an important step if you want to see site-specific information and recommendations. To get, the, to get to this page, click on the Add Stations tab from the sidebar. If you continue to scroll down, you will see a map of available weather stations. Most of the stations in Washington are Ag WeatherNet stations. They're the red markers, and there are lots of them to choose from. I've zoomed in here for a closer look. If you click on one of the markers, you will get some information about that station. This one is the Juniper Washington site. Click on Add if you want to select this station. It will look like this. If you change your mind, you can click again to remove it. You can choose several more stations while you're here, but when you're done, you have to confirm them by clicking on Save. This will either be in a sidebar on the right or it will appear at the bottom of your screen. Another feature you can access from your accounts page is the contour maps for several important insect pests. These are those pest density maps that are created using my weekly insect monitoring data. This map shows potato tuber worm numbers, and right now I have it zoomed in to show the areas around the towns of Mattawa, Moses Lake, and Othello. This adjuster allows you to zoom in or to zoom out, and you can also drag the map around to focus on the areas you care about. This is where you choose the year, you can go back in time all the way to 2017, or you can look at the current year's output. It will default to the current year. And with the blue slider, you can select the date the map was produced. This is the map for June 25th in 2021. These maps are actually much larger than this, but I wanted to be able to highlight the slider feature, so I cut off some of the map. 
By scrolling the slider, you can see how the insect population is changing with time. This is July 16th. This is August 20th. And this is September 17th. By clicking on your selected weather station within the contour map, you can bring up some contextual information about the pest and some ma management recommendations. This will be a new feature of the maps in 2022. And this is what it should look like from a cell phone. We also have a couple of insect development models, also called phenology models, for Colorado potato beetle and potato psyllid. They will be linked to your stations because they use weather data from those stations to run the models. This is the Colorado potato beetle phenology model output for one of my selected stations last year. The model uses cumulative degree day information and forecast temperatures to predict when different life stages of the insect will occur. The blue dots on the left side of this graph are the emerging overwintered adult beetles. They lay eggs, and in a short matter of time, larvae will hatch. That's the next set of dots on the graph. Eventually, those larvae will drop to the ground to pupate, and then the second generation of adults will follow. This information is very helpful for Colorado potato beetle management because most foliar insecticides used to control this pest need to be targeted to newly hatched small larvae. We generally recommend these applications are made when about 50% of the larvae have hatched. And according to this graph, it's time. According to the model, about 52% of first generation egg masses will have hatched at this site by June 3rd. A single well-timed application should be all it takes to get the population under control. This is the potato psyllid phenology model output for one of my selected sites at the end of August in 2021. Management strategies for potato psyllid also depend on which life stages are present. So again, this is a very useful tool. I should note that the models will also be accompanied by important contextual information and management recommendations. The Potato Decision Aid system is very new, but we are making some good progress. There is still a lot more to come. We're working on more models like a nematode development model and others, and on some new features like a pesticide spray guide that will be similar to the one that's offered on the tree fruit site. If you have any suggestions, we really appreciate your feedback. This is a great time for feedback because things are still new and modifiable. You can reach out to us via the contact page from the Potato DAS homepage, or you can send an email. This email link is found throughout the system and it actually sends the emails directly to me. Thanks for your interest in the new Potato Decision Aid system. Here's my contact information. It would be great to hear from you.